The story of Steins Gate at first seems wrapped up. Okabe reunited with the woman he loved. The looming global war has been avoided. A happy ending was reached. But that would be ignoring the sacrifice it took to get here. The struggles of the Okabe who lives in the shadow of this world line, who suffered for years to bring the hopeful future known as Steins Gate to reality. The one who would send the video that allowed this Okabe to continue fighting against fate and time itself. The original story we all know and love owes their happiness to the suffering of another mad scientist. One that would navigate his trauma and relationships with others to prevent a war for control of time. This is the story of another world, of the sacrifice it took to achieve the fairy tale ending. This is the story of Steins Gate Zero. The world line we find ourselves in is a version of the major beta line, picking up after Okabe's failure to save Kurisu, accidentally killing the woman he loved. Instead of getting himself back up, he caved to the pressure. He couldn't bring himself to continue fighting to save her, afraid of losing Mayuri, believing that there is no future where both of them are able to live. The fates have forced a terrible choice upon his shoulders, and he must burden the results. He never goes back to try and save Kurisu again. He never receives a slap from his childhood friend to wake him from the depression looming over his head. He never receives a message from his future self of a different world line, telling him to continue on. And that's solely because the catalyst for these events have yet to happen. Okabe must suffer for years before Steins Gate becomes achievable, and so for years he meanders through life, stripping himself of the persona known as Ryonin Kyoma, living life as a normal college student. Our story picks up just months after the failed attempt to save Kurisu. The lab isn't what it used to be. Oftentimes, Daru and his daughter from the future are the only ones there. Okabe no longer experiments on gadgets, afraid of replicating the phone microwave and sending them down the world line where Mayuri dies. He continuously brushes Suzaha's request to try and stop the future they are set down with World War III on the horizon. But Okabe believes that the future is unavoidable, and they currently exist in the best timeline possible. His fears of what may happen, and the possibility of seeing more friends die, clouds his judgment, and prevents him from searching for a better reality. Their lives continue on like this, until the first spark of global conflict finds them. Amadeus, an artificial intelligence program that uses the memories of a person from a select point in time to listen, react, and talk per that individual's persona. He has the capabilities to build from those memories, using it as a springboard for how they should go about scenarios and grow from them. It's revolutionary, and created by America's Victor University Neuroscience Lab, the same college Kudisu attended. The two main researchers, Maho and Leskin, take part in a research presentation which leads them to meet Okabe, who Maho finds out knew her kohai just before she died. This leads them to reminisce about the girl, and when Leskin overhears this, he offers Okabe a proposal. What if it was possible for him to talk to Kurisu once again? It's not that Kurisu lives on as an AI. That is something made very clear to Okabe before meeting this program. Kurisu is dead and will never return. What we see in front of us is merely a copy of her memories used by a learning program. It's important to separate your feelings from it. Maho was hesitant to introduce this AI to Okabe, seeing that his connection with Kurisu is more emotional than he leads on. But he's insistent he can handle it, and so Okabe reunites with a copy of the girl he so desperately wished to save. Over the next several days, Okabe talks with the Amadeus program quite often. It's clear its resemblance to Kurisu is sucking him in, his feelings for the girl and talking to her likeness both painful and bittersweet. Maho had introduced him to Amadeus, hoping that it could help bring closure to his time with Kurisu. But it's clear now, the program is actually harming his process of grief. It's hanging him up on her, the program's so real it's as if she's still here, that she hasn't died. But Maho wakes him up to reality. The curiosity of science leads us to create things that may only cause harm. And not all harm is physical. You could argue the invention of AI of the dead causes more pain than any weapon of war. Yet whether or not this AI should have been created is a decision to make after the fact. That is how science usually operates. It's what led Okabe to create a time machine, and it's also why he finds himself here, talking to a program of his dead friend. Science can be cruel. No! No! 
Okabe's mind seems heavily damaged from not only the trauma he's suffered, but the constant time leaps he's taken. At times, it's hard to dissect what his reality is. What separates this Okabe from the rest of the Okabes that exist over the infinite number of world lines, all happening simultaneously? We may believe that the theory of relativity indicates that all of time shares the same space, but yet with this, more questions fill our head, ones we cannot test nor answer. How exactly does time itself work? At a young age, my grandmother introduced me to a little game called Mahjong, and it would seem my interest in the game as well as anime have collided today with Ritchie City's newest collaboration with Stein's Gate. Ritchie City has brought to life your favorite characters from Okabe and Krisu to Mayuri and Suzuhan in the newest event, Loopers at the Number Line's Origin. Earn Dr. Ritchie while playing ranked matches and one round challenges, and use those spoils to explore the map and solve the mystery at the center of its story by talking with the iconic characters and earning valuable rewards. Test your luck in the limited time gacha and see if you can claim one of these four characters, or try to claim a high score in the Upa Claw minigame. Lichi City has loads of content for you to check out, including traditional four-player mahjong to play with your friends or others online, along with other unique events and minigames. Even if you've never played mahjong before, Lichi City has a tutorial that can teach you anything from the basics to the most advanced. With all the different ways to play and characters to adore and collect, it's a mahjong game like no other. You can check out Ichi City for yourself and their Steins Gate collaboration for free. Available now on PC, Android, and iOS. Life continues. Okabe reels himself back to reality and separates the Krisu of Amadeus from the one he knew in life. This program is not the woman he loved. At the same time, another key piece to the puzzle that leads to the beginning of World War III enters his life. The appearance of another girl who traveled time with Suza, Kagari. The adopted daughter of Mayuri from the year 2036 traveled back with Suzaha to escape an attack on the lab, saving her life. Before jumping to 2010, Suzaha made her first stop in 1998, where she fixed the Y2K problem, reformatting the computers not able to read a year date over 1999. Future Dadu had thought that fixing this issue could possibly prevent the future world war, but in reality, it was a very minor solution, and the stop only resulted in Suzaha losing track of Kagari who had reawakened as a sleeper agent. Something unbeknownst to Mayuri, Daru, or Suzuha was that a man had experimented on Kagari as part of her treatment for PTSD from being in a war zone as a child. That man had created her into a soldier lacking emotion, who can be awakened at chance times. Kagari hears the voice of God beckoning her, shooting Suzaha and fleeing into the world of Tokyo in 1998. Unable to waste any more time here, Suzaha traveled to 2010 alone where things play out as they did, but now her search for the girl leads her to find Kagari 12 years older, with not a single memory of who she is or where she's from. Kagari suffers from amnesia. Suzuha instantly recognizes the girl, and suspecting an organization to be searching for her, they create a protection program around her. There's a worry that someone has figured out that she has come from the future, which would be solidified on New Year's Day. As the group enjoys the holiday surrounded by friends, time stops, just as it did the day that Mayuri would die. Okabe instantly assumes the worst has come to pass, though it shouldn't. They are on the major beta world line. Kurisu died so Mayuri could live. How is it possible for an assault in the lab to happen? CERN shouldn't even have them on the radar. A mass group once more raids the apartment, though this time they don't seem to be rounder. These militants wear unique and diverse masks, led by a woman in a motorcycle helmet. Whether they know this organization or not, there is no way out of this one. No time machine to reset the day, no element of surprise. Okabe starts to panic when an unlikely ally steps in. <laughs> Further solidifying the group's inaffiliation with Rounder and CERN, Brown steps into the situation. He and Suzaha are able to force a retreat, and Kagari, who they were all too obviously after, is saved. They raise security around her. Given it's clear Rounder and CERN are not involved in the time machine wars in this world line, Okabe makes a risky move in going to Brown and explaining that he knows of his affiliation as a shadow operator for CERN. He makes clear he's not attempting to expose him for this, but as a way to employ his and Moika's help in ensuring Kagari's safety. Using Brown's own daughter's safety, who oftentimes hangs out with the girls in the lab, as leverage. These negotiations are successful, and Brown tells him to look into Derp 
Europa and Stratfor, two US organizations that look squeaky clean on the surface, but all too often run shadow operations off the record. The code talking he overheard them using when they attacked the lab, common Western code. Given that Okabe knows that a time war will break out between Russia and the US, and Russia already holds the information they need to begin creating a time machine with Kurisu's theory her father stole before her death, the United States is the only possible party that could be involved. While Okabe looks into these two organizations, Maho attempts to reboot the Amadeus system, which suffered a cyber attack at the same time the masked individuals raided the lab. Strangely, Okabe receives a call from Amadeus, which doesn't make any logical sense. First of all, Amadeus would always video chat so it could interact with him and see visually through his phone cameras the world around them. But either way, the program is still down. For whatever reason, Okabe chooses to answer this phone call, which sends him to a new world line, one that exists within the major alpha line. How and why he jumped to an entirely new major line is explained by what we know of the variations between the two major lines. In Alpha, where Mayuri dies, CERN gets a hold of Kurisu's research and gets ahead of Russia and the US in the time machine development, causing the entity to rule over the world. In Beta, where Kurisu dies, US and Russia ignite in a war over time machines. The call Okabe answered was from CERN, who hacked into the Amadeus network, stealing Kurisu's data which had her time machine theory in it, allowing them to once more gain control over the concept of time. Well, the jump back to Beta is rather easy in theory. Send a D-mail back and tell Maho to close the back door that CERN used. The hard part is once more forsaking Kurisu's life and also coming to terms with the reality in this world that Mayuri is currently dead. Every time Okabe has to make a decision to jump lines, it's like he personally chooses to kill that person. Every jump carries the weight of death around it the waist slowly unraveling his mind. Kurisu once again becomes his pillar of strength, his rock, pushing him forward to solve the hard problem in front of him. They once more kiss as she presses the button that will erase her friendships, her love for Okabe, and all the time they shared in this lab. Kurisu once more becomes dead, at least from our perspective. <gasps> There's no mistaking Okabe has awakened in a beta world line, though there are subtle differences than the one he was in prior. Maho's hotel room has been shaken down, possibly in search of data from Amadeus, though whoever did it found nothing. They opt to send her to live with Akia, Moeka staying as well to act as a bodyguard. Meanwhile, Suzaha has lost all patience for the stagnation of saving the world and attempts to force Okabe to go with her to the past to hopefully reach Stein's Gate and prevent World War III from happening. Okabe is once more insistent that there is no way to reach that pipe dream, and even with a gun to his face, he refuses to travel back. They're locked in a stalemate, Dadu appearing in the stairway to defuse the situation. He tells Suzuha that there is no point in forcing Okabe to help prevent the future. He tells her to think of what he's seen, to be so insistent on giving up changing the future. She breaks down, unsure what she's supposed to do. She had been sent with the sole purpose of preventing the global conflict, yet here she is unable to do anything. She feels useless. Dadu stays with her on the rooftop, promising to help her find a solution she is happy with, while Okabe goes to the park to think over what's become of himself. It's not as if he doesn't want to stop the incoming war, it's just that he doesn't know what he can do. He can't save Kurisu since that ends with Mayuri's death and CERN overtaking the world. He has no ability to prevent the international conflict. He's just a Japanese college student. He's at a loss. Yeah, that doesn't mean he gives up. He continues his research into Stratfor and Derpa when Maho reveals something that may just endanger the entire world line. Maho had kept Kurisu's laptop, one that contains all her data, including that of her time travel theories. This has to be what the thief who entered her hotel room was looking for, its existence of Pandora's box waiting to leak dangerous information that could incite violence across the continents. The Americans, or even CERN, could be attempting to get a hold of this information, putting the world line in their lives at risk. They find Dadu, who's been trying to crack the laptop from Mao, and discuss destroying the computer when the motorcycle helmets return, and we know exactly what they're after. Running only gets them so far. Trapped in an alleyway with nowhere to go, Okabe is forced to hand over the computer to the motorheads. All seems lost. That is, before a van rolls by the entrance of the alley, doors swinging open. <laughs> Bullets spray the enclosed space. Okabe pulls Maho to the pavement, 
Dadu's sheltering in place as well. In the crossfire, the laptop is destroyed, the information leak prevented thanks to a Russian drive-by. The motorheads are forced to retreat, being grazed by bullets flying sporadically through the space, marking those that hide under their masks. The Americans are left in the dark, that is, for now. The scene was incredibly traumatizing for Maho, falling into complete shock after the adrenaline leaves her body. The laptop was the only memento she had of Kurisu, and now, with it gone, she's left to process that loss along with being caught in a firefight. Okabe stays by her side to give her comfort as she drifts to sleep. The next day begins, marking her departure back to the States. Leskin and Maho are returning to the university, which means Okabe is saying goodbye to them, along with his access to Amadeus Kurisu. Leskin makes clear his ambitions to recruit Okabe to the university, which means that these three will be in contact sooner rather than later. The group in the motorcycle helmets remains a mystery for some time longer, though there are two individuals that come off as suspects. The first is Dadu's future wife, Yuki, who has had injuries that followed two of the three attacks we know of. These, however, turn out to be injuries from a cooking class she teaches, Yuki having a good alibi for her location at these times, that being Okabe's mom. She is a red herring that keeps your eyes averted from the true suspect. Judy, a co-worker of Leskin and Maho, who is seen with an injured hand on an airplane following the alley shootout. Which American organization the motorcycle helmets are tied to is wrapped in mystery, one which cannot be solved now. For at this time, Kagari has finally awoken some of her repressed memories when coming into contact with a certain melody. The voice of God called to her to carry out a mission that will bring forth the end of the free world. <laughs> Coming to in the hospital, Kagari begins calling Mayuri mother, which forces Okabe to explain to her how she adopts Kagari in the future. Mayuri is rather understanding and accepts this affection with open arms, as odd as it is. Things seem up from here now that she's been able to regain some of her memories, but an investigation from Oweka leads to some dark findings. While for weeks she was unable to discover anything of note about Kagari's whereabouts for the past 10 years, she had finally traced Stratfo to the ownership of an abandoned factory, one which she and Okabe find a secret passage that appears to have been a prison for Kagari for some time. The walls and floors are covered in red lettering, blocked and crude in misshapen patterns, marks and etchings that speak to insanity. In line with this finding, Kagari awakens as a sleeper agent, emotion leaving her eyes as she hears a melody. She sets off in a new direction, away from the lab, dropping the cake she had bought to bring Mayuri. From this point onward, Kagari is considered missing. Suzuha has not let go of her mission to prevent a global war, and so she convinces Dado to reach out to Maho about assisting them in recreating the time leap machine Okabe has banned them from researching. At first, she's hesitant about trying to recreate a machine that her Kohai had originally developed. She sees herself as inferior to Kurisu as someone who isn't nearly as gifted or intelligent, which has led her to undermine her own abilities. After some convincing, she agrees to come back to Japan and assist, but unless she is able to overcome her self-doubt, she'll never be able to succeed and create the invention. Time will tell if she can find her true strength. Wrapping up the call, Daru steps out of the lab to go see Yuki, while Suzuha lounges around the lab. <laughs> She had anticipated one of these agents would try to sneak into the lab, taking the intruder by surprise and holding them hostage. She has them take their helmet off, which reveals a reality both painful and expected, Kagari's alternate identity. Whatever Stratfor did to her, it created a killing machine that is hell-bent on preventing Suzuha from furthering any time-related research. The two break out into a fight as Kagari seizes the toy Mayuri gave her as a child and flees the lab. Tears stream down her face, showing that somewhere deep in her psyche, her true self remains, but at this time, the brainwash keeps it at bay. Unaware that her true reason for returning is to help create a time leap machine, Okabe picks up Maho from the airport, with only one week before Suzaha has to make a time leap back to the day everything went wrong. Due to insufficient fuel only giving her a one day window of travel, she begins to get antsy. The time leap machine that will act as their safety net has yet to be finished, Maho trying her best, yet she lacks the understanding of how Kurisu and Okabe were able to compress human memories. At the same time, Suzaha worries about her father's stagnation with her future mom. Wanting to see them happy together before she goes, she steps out to plot how to get them to confess their feelings to one another. While she's out from the lab, Dadu and Maho receive an unexpected visitor. <gasps> 
It doesn't take him long to see what they are building. He's shocked, but also terrified of what the Time Leap Machine represents. He begins going on a crazed rant, afraid of Mayuri's death and frustrated that they would undermine Kurisu's sacrifice. For Maho, this is the first time she's heard the idea of convergent points, events that must happen in these major world lines. But Okabe is too riled up to pay that any mind. He calls her a murderer. The very fact they're building this machine means putting lives on the line. How could she be okay with sentencing people to death? This comment is where Dadu draws a line, stepping in to bring him back to reality. Okay. <laughs> He tells his friend that he's ignoring the feelings of others, living in his own world of suffering, not realizing that they are all going through shit. Suzuha has the burden of stopping World War III on her shoulders. Dadu and Maho are doing their best to support her and relieve that pressure if only a bit, even if that means making Okabe uncomfortable. He talks about how much he's suffering but doesn't realize how much Mayuri is going through because of his actions. She regrets the decision she made on the rooftop when Okabe failed to save Kurisu. Regrets not pushing him to keep trying, instead telling them to stop putting so much weight on his shoulders. She realizes now that Okabe was the only man for the job. He's the only one that could save Kurisu, but because she chose to not be tough on him, he never had the spirit to continue fighting. He walks around as if regretting his decision to give up, yet he doesn't do anything to keep trying. It's hard for her to watch him sulk, hard for her to burden that she's the reason he stopped fighting. Okabe hasn't paid this any mind. He simply tells her to not think about anything, to ignore what could have been, but it really is too much for her. She wants to change her decision, wants to go back and slap sense into Okabe so he doesn't end up so hollow. And while that may seem impossible in our reality, it isn't too far-fetched in a world with a working time machine. The deadline has come for Suzaha to travel back. If not now, she'll miss her window to prevent a global war completely. Finding her own determination, despite Okabe's insistence, she stays out of it. Mayuri comes to the rooftop, asking Suzaha to let her go back with her to reason with Okabe. The final frontier arrives. Okabe races to the lab after hearing a voicemail from Mayuri telling him she's traveling back. But when he enters, he only finds out that she's already on her way to Voyage Time. He races to the radio building rooftop while Dadu and Maho deal with their own crisis. Amadeus has yet again been cracked and they've been locked out. Its final message printed on a hacked message board, warning them of the culprit behind the cyber attack. Phone service is completely down as well, this moment in time playing to very similar notes as the various convergent points we've witnessed. This moment will either bring great tragedy or a path to a new timeline. That is up for Okabe to decide. Mayuri! At first, Okabe tries to stop Mayuri from leaving, Suzuha firing off warning shots to keep him back, telling him that this is her decision to make. They must continue trying to bring the world into Stein's gate, even if he's unwilling to help. Okabe continues to crawl towards them, even after being grazed in the thigh. But Mayuri speaks from the heart. She tells him she's tired of seeing Okabe so sad and depressed. She's not happy with the decision she made, so she'll go back and change it. Because what she wants more than anything is for the person she loves to be happy. This is her decision to make, and he must simply accept that. There's no point in trying to stop her. Hearing this, he's forced to accept that she'll be leaving. Suzaha ties the cloth around his wound before setting back out the rooftop door to complete her mission. As she exits onto the roof, she receives a message from her future father, telling her that their choices up to this point have altered time very slightly, but enough to where the world line of Stein's gate is within reach. To ensure success, future Dadu tells her they must complete Operation Arclight. Her role ensures she and Mayuri board the time machine. While this may seem easy, the Worldline Beta will be working against them as World War III is fated to begin, right here on this rooftop. <laughs> Mayuri is taken hostage by this American group. It's pretty clear that it's Stratfor. They finally pinpointed the time machine's location. Suzaha is able to take out a few, allowing Mayuri to make a dash for the stairs, but she doesn't get too far before taking a bullet to the head. She drops to the ground, but from the size of the blood leaving her head, the shot only grazed her. Though Kagari, who appears on the rooftop, does not know that. She launches herself at the soldiers, massacring every last one in the name of her mother. Hearing the commotion, Okabe tries to climb the stairs and check what's going on. But Leskin appears from below, walking towards him slowly, 
gun pointing towards him. Leskin reveals his true nature, how his future self brainwashed Kagari, and when she was sent back in time with Suzaha, she awoke as a sleeper agent, revealing to Leskin's past self the concept of time machines, and an elaborate plan to seize this time machine from the radio building on this exact day when World War III would begin, allowing him and him alone to control time. The Russians have yet to successfully complete their machine based on Kurisu's research. The Americans have only just obtained the data from hacking Kurisu's memories with Amadeus. If he were able to take the machine here, he'd be the only party with current access. He can alter the world however he wants. Stratfo has partnered with him to see this through. They helped him brainwash and oversee Kagari for the past decade, had helped him oversee Okabe, had introduced Kagari into the lab members group. Leskin has orchestrated everything for this particular moment, yet he's reckless and inexperienced with combat all the same. Okabe tackles him, knocking the gun from his hand as he hits his head and falls unconscious. Running up the stairs, he finds Kagari mortally wounded, quickly bleeding out. More soldiers arrive on the rooftop, holding Dadu and Maho hostage. They had tried to follow Okabe after he had bolted from the lab, but were captured in the process. Kagari makes a window for Suzuha to attack freeing the two lab members and mounting Leskin. She rains down fist after fist on his face, rage and adrenaline fueling a primal desire to make him disappear from this world, make him feel an ounce of the pain he put Kagari through. But Daru stops her. She doesn't need to sink to his level. She's made her point. Running low on time, the group mourns the death of Kagari, but a black hawk interrupts their sadness. Mayuri and Suzaha are forced to use the time machine now, or miss the window entirely as the rooftop is flooded with more soldiers. They begin firing it up as the soldiers rain fire at its door, attempting to stop them from making the jump. It seems the two of them have made it just in time, when a Russian attack chopper is heard in the distance. With their own time machine in the making, they have no interest in capturing this one. Unlike the Americans, their goal is simply its destruction. The jump wasn't fast enough. Bits of the time machine were scattered in the wreckage. Mayuri and Suzaha have died. Wakabe is broken, unable to process their deaths, and instantly goes to the lab to try to use the time leap, but it's yet to be completed. Maho was unable to solve the problem of compressing memories, a wall she doesn't believe she can overcome on her own. But now isn't the time for her egos. Two of their friends have just died. She asks Okabe to tell her how he and Kurisu completed it, and the three of them see this machine to its completion. Dadu hacks into CERN so they can use the Hadron Collider they have on site. Okabe talks to Brown about using the CRTV to travel back and prevent the impending war. Maho makes final adjustments on the machine. Within the 48 hour window, it's ready. Okabe prepares to make the jump after thanking everyone for their assistance, as he wants more time leaps to the past, to prevent the dark future from ever coming to pass. Toast. The end result is the same. The convergent point is as cruel as the one that marks Kurisu's death as fate. No matter what he does, the time machine will always explode and kill Suzaha and Mayuri. The events may differ slightly, but the results do not. Yet still, Okabe will not allow himself to give up. He will not allow himself to accept the death of Mayuri as well. He fights against the fates and jumps once more, only this time he ends up 25 years in the future. <gasps> Someone must have intervened with the jump and transferred his memories forward in time, though no one is currently here to confirm that. Okabe wakes to an empty, dark room. He falls from his bed, his muscles weak and stiff. The fall pulls the IVs from his arm and knocks over the monitor next to his bed. He walks outside to find Akihabara has become dystopian rubble. It's a little unnerving and a lot to process. Just moments ago, this area was as busy as ever. Yet now, it's as if decades have gone by. Two soldiers attempt to approach him, only to be killed by Suzuha, who happened to be passing by. She takes him to her father, who explains to Okabe that years ago, they had said a timely divergence to this point in time, unsure if it would work, but given the fact that Okabe is alive in front of him, it would seem that it was a success. As Suzaha had confirmed for us long ago, Okabe technically died in 2025. Captured by Stratfo, they tortured him until the Valkyries, the lab team's rogue squad, were able to complete a successful rescue op. They were, however, too late. Okabe's heart may have still been beating, but mentally he was considered brain dead. The torture had destroyed what once was the man they knew. But with the power of time travel, they have a loophole to resurrect the husk of a body. Redirecting the transfer of memory data from one of Okabe's attempts to time leap 
sleep would send him to this body, reigniting its abilities. Thus, Okabe reawakens from an 11-year coma to carry out Operation Arclight. This plan puts a lot of pressure on Okabe's mental capabilities, pinpointing the explosion of the time machine as the catalyst that will send them into Stein's gate. Okabe must navigate backwards from 2036 to 2011, which means making over 3,000 time leaps, only able to travel two weeks and eventually 48 hours at a time. This is a lot for the human mind to handle, but his will is the strongest it's ever been. He will not fail. Maho and Dadu prepare to send him back as the finish line etches closer. Getting to 2025 was one thing, but here Okabe runs into an issue. With the next time leap, he'll land on the day he was kidnapped by Stratfo and tortured, which means he must evade his captors and return to this lab to once again time leap. Coming to on top of ruins within Akihabara, he quickly removes his GPS and Amadeus app from his phone that Stratfo was using to track him. The rest of the Valkyrie squad run in diverging directions with the app installed, confusing the soldiers and allowing Okabe time to get to the lab and leap once more. Okabe stumbles into the lab, asking Daru to punch him in the face, to take out his pent-up frustration from Okabe's depressed and hopeless attitude. With one right hook, Okabe resets his personality to once more take on the role of Ryonin Kyoma. He laughs to the ceiling, stringing together dramatic sentence structures with Jojo-level arm motions and poses. The mad scientist has returned, and he's ready to change fate one last time. Only, it isn't that simple. Despite his constant preparations, convergent points aren't easily changed. Leskin's actions are hard to prevent, and even more so, it seems no matter what he does, the Russian chopper will appear and destroy the machine just before Suzuha and Mayuri are able to successfully jump. Okabe brainstorms with Maho and Daru on how they could possibly avoid such an event, arriving at one conclusion. To prevent Leskin from knowing about the time machine's location, they must delete the data Amadeus has stored from being with Okabe before other parties gain access to it after hacking in. The only way to do this is to send a email to the past telling Maho not to reinstate Amadeus when it goes down a few months prior. Doing this eliminates the Russian chopper from the rooftop conflict, allowing them precious seconds to make sure the girls can jump successfully. The scene replays once again, Moeka and Kagari keeping Stratfo pinned down in the stairway as a Black Hawk approaches the roof, carrying its own guided missiles. Okabe watches the American copter approach, timing it against the machine leap process. The missile fires, the machine begins to fade from this space and time. As the missiles hit the building floor, it slices through the time machine as if it was an illusion. The two girls have successfully made their jump. A convergent point was prevented. The world line can successfully shift. The Stein's gate. A timeline where the lab members can live in peace, knowing the war was avoided. And time remains a mystery to mankind, not a catalyst for warfare. Mayuri is able to slap sense into Okabe. Okabe is able to save Kurisu and ensure that the documents her father took to Russia burn on the plane. Mayuri and Suzaha's extended job is done, and they rejump into time to avoid creating a paradox as two versions of them cannot exist in the same time space for too long. Due to the lack of fuel Suzaha had, she was forced to make a random jump which puts them at a point in time unknown to us. A place full of sand and harsh winds. From the looks, this may become their gravesite, the last known location of the two in time. But hope appears on these dunes. Okabe had tracked their jump point and has returned to bring them back to their world line. The job is done. The Okabe of Stein's Gate received the push he needed and the tools to do it. While the Okabe of Zero sees too that loose ends are tied up, returning Mayuri to their line so she can adopt Kagari so that Suzaha can take the place of herself once the other travels backwards, and so that he can die on that day in 2025. That is at least what I believe must have happened. We'll never know for sure as time can be a strange thing confusing, full of paradoxes and holes. We may never quite fully understand how Okabe was able to pull off such an elaborate alteration of fate, what exactly he ended up doing after saving these two from the sand dunes, but his determination to save his friends, to save the world, may have been enough for the fates to smile upon him just this once, and allow the man to rest within a world line that isn't full of suffering. A world line where his childhood friend doesn't die a horrible death. A world line where the love of his life remains in his life physically. A world line that was given the name Stein's Gate.